they just seemed like they were they were being blessed and blessing people so continue to lift them up in prayer so let's pray i want to just cover our our children's ministry this morning too so if you just would pray along with me and lord we are grateful to be here um to come to worship you to learn more of you god where would we be without jesus and lord we are so thankful lord we just pray for the team in the philippines just continued uh success lord in their travels that they'd be safe you know, that they would just be uh together as a team god you would just bind the enemy lord that uh, might try to pull them apart we pray for their health and we pray for those that have just been dealing with different issues that you would just minister to them and most of all lord just reach people for the kingdom lord we pray that you would just give them divine appointments god and go before them Lord, I, I do pray for our children's ministry and just in junior high, God, and the high schoolers are in the service. God, watch over these young minds. We pray, God, you would just be ministering to them through the teachers this morning. Uh, Lord, that you would just draw those kids to know you now, Lord, to be strong, to have a firm foundation, Lord. And God, we pray for Pastor Mike as he brings the word this morning, that you would just anoint him. God, you would speak through him. God, you'd minister to each one of us this morning through your word. And God, we thank you for your word. And just again, bless the rest of this morning, Lord. May we just keep our, our hearts focused on you. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, Tim, if you notice, the junior high parents are really clapping for you because you've just given them an idea. They heard your remark about duct tape. So, all right. Now you know the secret of controlling a junior hire. No, he didn't really. He's not really using duct tape. Well, folks, we're going to continue in our study of 1 Corinthians, and we're currently moving into a new chapter. We're in chapter 14. So why don't you open your Bibles with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and let's see what the Lord has for us. Now, as you're turning there, I have to admit, um, we're in a section that I, I forget how controversial this is, you know. Uh, I just had a brother this morning tell me, boy, our group had a lively interaction about tongues. It's like, to me, it's just like stuff I grew up with. When I got saved, I got plugged into uh, the Calvary Chapel movement, and I, I understood about the spiritual gifts, tongues and prophecy and the others, and I saw the proper use. I've visited other churches and have seen the abuse of many of the gifts. And my prayer as your pastor is that you won't be afraid of spiritual gifts. Uh, you won't be freaked out, but you'll know the proper usage, the proper place for them, and uh, that any of the confusing things that, that cause the controversy could be removed. Because, you know, that's part of my job as a pastor is to teach you, instruct you in the ways of the Lord, not just like a professor, but so that you might live the Christian life. Not just so you leave this place with more knowledge and information, but that you actually could, ah, oh, I'm going to try that. Oh, I see it's biblical. I'm going to do that. You know what I mean? So um, a little review is in, in the first, let's say, chapter 12 through 14. Uh, this is um, one of the three sections of Scripture that proclaim and describe spiritual gifts that you see active all throughout the book of Acts. And I really believe they're still around today. If you missed our study on that, I think it was last week, I talked about, uh, I explained how some people are called cessationists. Christians love the Lord. They're real Christians. But there is a group of Christians who believe that the gifts of the Holy Spirit, such as prophecy and gifts, have ceased. And they have their reasons why. And last week, if you missed it, go, it's online. You could stream it or download it. I explained why I don't believe the gifts have ceased. <laughs> One of the reasons is because I've seen them and experienced them in action, but biblical reasons as well, okay? And there's, it's no coincidence, by the way, that sandwiched in between chapter 12 and chapter 14 about the spiritual gifts is chapter 13, the love chapter, all about love. Because, you know, I, it took me years to get this. I used to think, well, Paul's teaching on the spiritual gifts, then he took a break. And he thought, let's, let's talk about love. Well, we got sidetracked. Now let's get back on topic. No, it wasn't a sidetrack. He's not getting back on topic. Love is, is, is essential that when you're talking about spiritual gifts, 
It's essential to have love as the, at the center of the whole thing because there are people who are showmen. I don't know if you've ever been to some churches where somebody stands up and goes, Thus saith the Lord, 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 Lord. Or they got those vibrate oh, my people. And you go, here he goes. It's the showman, you know. And, and there are people who do that, but if you understand the spiritual gifts are real, there's a right way and a wrong way to use them, there's time not to use them, there's time to use them, and it must all be governed by love. That's why I called today's message, Let Love Direct your spiritual gift. So if you missed it, go back and listen to chapter 13. There's a two-parter about cessationism and as well as the, the priority of love. And, it, you know, Paul is stressing here, even in chapter 14, which I missed it for years, that chapter 13, the flavor of it, the aroma of it, is continuing in chapter 14 of the preeminence of love over the spiritual gifts that it's more important, and it has to direct the spiritual gifts. Now, if you, get, if you have a, a growth group and you're waiting for your first fill-in so you don't miss it, here it is, okay? Remember, the Corinthian believers, like many Pentecostals today, were susceptible to the fatal da danger of placing such a value upon spiritual gifts that they miss the importance of love. It ain't about you being so spiritual, you don't go to church to try to impress people. You don't go, you know, walk around like you're so holy. I'll tell you how we know if you're holy, if you love one another. If you love the Lord and you love your neighbor, that's how we know you're spiritual. That's, that's the greatest factor of, the, of what we call it, the fruit of the Spirit, love. Uh, remember last week I, I quoted it's, who knew you'd find it in the New King James Study Bible, there was a little quote that says that the gifts are temporary containers of God's work. Love is the work itself. I like that. I think that should be a bumper sticker if we could put that many words on one, okay? And so last week we dealt with that cessationist thing I told you about, uh, that they believe the gifts of prophecy and tongues and others have ceased. But today we're, Paul continues his thought process of stressing the spiritual gifts and love in appropriate order, in appropriate perspective. Let's look at verse 1 of 1 Corinthians 14. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Father, we pray before we go any further that you help us to get your heart in this. Lord, I know, Father, there are those with their guards up here this morning. I know there are those who may be waiting for us to open up the gate so they could go off and running. There's such a variety of responses to the spiritual gifts. But Lord, we want your heart. We want your perspective. We want everything you have for us, every spiritual gift. But we want to practice those gifts as you direct, not maybe as we've seen it in the past, misused or abused, and not as our flesh desires. But Lord, have your way. Teach us. Teach us, Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, since love is the greatest, remember that was the last verse in chapter 13. It says, now abide faith, hope, and love. These three, and the greatest is love. Love is the greatest. And so in 14.1, in we're told to pursue love. Again, it's no coincidence. There's two things, love and the gifts. One, you're to pursue, chase after it, make it your aim. The other, you're to have a desire for it but you're running after one and you're hungering for the other and keep the proper perspective of the way Paul puts it. Uh, when it comes to the spiritual gifts, by the way, it's not one or the other. Well, you might have spiritual gifts. I've heard churches say this, people in churches. Well, they've got spiritual gifts, but we've got love. Well, you're supposed to have both. It's not like, take your pick. You could either have chocolate or vanilla. Love or spiritual gifts. You, God wants us to ha have them both, Okay. Now, notice in verse 1, the first part says, Pursue love and desire the gifts. I think that's God's will for every Christian. Well, that's for those charismatics, those Pentecostals, those crazies. No, this is God speaking to his people. We're to chase after love with everything we got. And yet we're supposed to also desire whatever spiritual gift God has. Now, here's your next fill-in. Love must be 
must pilot and direct the spiritual gifts. In other words, when it comes to exercising your spiritual gift, you must make sure that you're operating in love and for the benefit of others. In love and for the benefit of others. Why do I say that? Because I've been to churches that, has, that have had people who, they're so into the spiritual gifts, it's, you know, it's almost like the pastor blows a whistle and everyone goes loose. You know, some churches, there's that time when certain people go, this is my opportunity, and they go off. And it freaks a lot of people out, right? I believe if you practice your spiritual gift boldly and properly, nobody's freaked out. Uh, people might be going, what is that? On the day of Pentecost that happened. We're going to look at that in a moment. People might, it's actually scriptural that people would see the spiritual gifts and go, what meaneth this? Because <laughs> we'll see it. and We're going to go to Acts chapter 2 in a moment. And so, you know, there are some things God does that might, might make you question or wonder or be curious. But, but God isn't the boogeyman. Spiritual gifts shouldn't scare you, okay? Because some people, <laughs> I've seen people around, and, and some guy goes up, oh, my people, and everyone around them go, jumps, you know? That's why, in the, even in the shepherd's sheep, I put, ask yourself some questions. Who's being blessed by this? Who benefits by this? And am I, you know, am I being a showman? I might forget all the questions I put in there. But you really need to be honest and ask yourself a few questions if you have a gift and want to use it properly. Uh, so we're going to see in this chapter that there are times when you should actually hold back from using your gift. Uh, we're going to see that there are times when you shouldn't speak in tongues. Some of you are relieved to hear that, okay? Uh, and the question is, oh, here, I got a list of questions right here. Will it edify? Is it loving? When, when, when I, want to, I want to be used by God, I want to speak out. Is it edifying? Is it loving? Is it selfish? Is it self-promoting? Who benefits? I mean, I've heard people leave church and go, oh, I feel so much better now. Sure, you're the one hooting and hollering, and everybody else got scared to death. You emptied the place out, you know? Now, I want to leave church feeling better, but I want to feel better because I got to bless somebody. And because God blessed me. It's got to go two ways. God's blessing me, and I'm blessing others. That's what the spiritual gifts should look like. <clears throat> so, that's why Paul says in the, in the second part of uh, verse 1, he says, but especially that you might prophesy. And, and we're going we're gonna to look at that today. I'm going to move slower, and I, I might not even finish my notes, because there's a lot of my heart I want to share with you, and I want to make sure you get it. Because, well, let's just take a poll. How many of you guys have ever gone to a church or experienced what some people call spiritual gifts, but it was freaky and weird and, and you, it scared you? Anybody see that? Look around. People abuse the gifts. How many of you have ever experienced spiritual gifts and were blessed by it? It was the real thing and you're glad you experienced it. Well, that's about half and half. How many of you guys have never experienced or never seen spiritual gifts, fake or real? Interesting. A little bit less than that. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to show you right now. No, I'm not going to. All I know is as a pastor, it's my responsibility to go through the scriptures and teach you. And I've told you many times, I want the real thing. I want everything God has for us. But I don't want a circus because that's not what God has for us. Okay? And so when he talks about especially that you might prophesy, we're going to see as we look at the text. The reason why Paul puts prophecy in front of, of tongues is because tongues don't really bless people around you unless it's interpreted. All it is is you're going, what in the world is he saying or she saying? But prophecy is you're hearing the mind of God being, being revealed and you're going, whoa. And many times the secrets of your heart are exposed and you're going, whoa, that was just what I needed. So prophecy is better than tongues unless tongues is interpreted. We're going to look at that in more detail. But let me give you, I, was, I read a lot of different commentaries. I wanted to make sure is there something I'm missing here? Is there something I want? I need to change in my perspective of the gifts. And one of the commentators I read, his name is John Ray, and I really haven't used him, I don't think, before. He says that prophecy, his comment, and this is your fill-in, okay? Preaching is a means of expressing and explaining what one already knows, and that which has, uh, he has learned or studied previously. Prophecy, however, is directly proclaiming the mind of God. 
by the inspiration of, and the prompting of the Holy Spirit and not from one's own thoughts. It, it is supernatural speech in known language and the Holy Spirit leads believers to express truths that are in agreement with the truth of the Bible. There's an important, I, I included that last line, which in the commentary I was reading, I'm not even sure if that's part of the original quote, because if somebody prophesies and it's, it's not, it doesn't agree with something you know to be true in Scripture, you could judge that's not true prophecy, okay? True prophecy from God is going to agree with Scripture. There's not going to be a new revelation. I used to, God says, I used to say this, and I've changed it now. It's this. God doesn't change his mind. And doctrine, true Bible doctrine doesn't change. <clears throat> if you have false doctrine, you might be corrected by that, but by true doctrine. But, but prophecy will always be able to be tested by Scripture. You get, somebody says something, you look in the Scripture and find out if it's contrary to Scripture. But sometimes it's harder because prophecy is personal. Like I told you before, most New Testament prophecy, read through the book of Acts, isn't, it isn't doctrinal. None of it was doctrinal, actually. It was revealing God's heart and mind to you about something he wants to direct you in or warn you about, a coming famine, or uh, Agabus prophesied that, that Paul would be bound by, that belt, by his belt, uh, that he'd be bound and delivered over to the Gentiles. God's speaking a personal message to a person or a group of people. And so that's why, I, and I've, I'm repeating last week's study, that's what, one of the reasons I don't believe prophecy has passed you know, and ceased because I've been spoken to personally by God through men who, and women who spoke prophetically, and I'm so grateful. I'm so thankful. Because, uh, you know, I, I'm thankful for the Bible. I believe the Bible. I, I read the Bible, and I cling to it. I cherish the Bible. But there's certain personal things that the Bible's not going to tell you. Well, Mike, I want you to move. I want you to do, you know, don't buy that car. You know, there's certain things that go, God, direct me. And there's been times where people have spoken and go, wow, that was just what I needed to hear. Again, we'll, we'll look more clearly what it means. Matter of fact, the gift of prophecy is the only gift that is included in all three categories of spiritual gifts. And if you're taking notes, you might want to write this down. There's three basic categories of spiritual gifts. There's number one, motivational gifts. And that's found in Romans chapter 12, uh, verse 3 through 9. Motivational gifts. Prophecy is listed in there. Number two is ministry gifts. And that's listed in, in 1 Corinthians 12 that we already covered. Prophecy is in the list of ministry gifts. Also, there's manifestation gifts. That's found in 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 11, talking about the manifestation of the Holy Spirit. Prophecy is found in every description of spiritual gifts in the New Testament, every category, motivational, ministry, and manifestation gifts. <coughs> Excuse me. And, and so the gift can be used by the Holy Spirit to convict someone of sin, of righteousness, or judgment to come. And let me give you a couple examples. Like I told you, I'm going to move slower right now because there's a lot of confusion about these spiritual gifts. And I have, I have a confession to make. Some of you think, I, I remember I've sat through studies on the gifts of the Spirit. When the, the study's over, the pastor closes the Bible, and then you never see it happening. Okay, you, okay I thought now we're going to start doing it. That's up to God. I'm not going to go, I've trained you, now do it. No, no, it's up to God, okay? And I also believe many of the, the, the true legitimate uses of the spiritual gifts takes place in your small groups or before and after a church. It's not a part of the show, you know what I mean? All right, we're having church now, everybody go for it. It's not a big show. Legitimate spiritual gifts, there's times you could be coming in here and you're here a little early or you're staying afterwards and you notice somebody and the Lord just speaks to your heart. That person needs encouragement. And you walk over and you say, how you doing? You need some prayer? You okay? And the Lord gives you maybe a prophetic word for them or maybe a word of wisdom, word of knowledge, some of the things we've already talked about. The gifts of the Holy Spirit, it's not a show you turn on and turn off like Sunday morning, you start the bell and everyone's going, no, 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 no. You should be using, if you have a spiritual gift, you should be using it all week long. You're in the grocery store line, and the Lord tells you, I want you to share with that lady in front of you or that guy behind you. And you, scary? Not if the Holy Spirit is empowering you. You're, it's exciting. 
And so the spiritual gifts aren't for a big show on Sunday morning. It's for all week long. You're letting the Lord use you and speak through you and minister to you and minister through you. But let me, let's look at a couple examples in the book of Acts. Uh, after receiving a letter from Jerusalem, uh, the church was trying to weigh out this whole thing about Judaizers and circumcision and everything. Uh, they received these, this letter in Acts chapter 15. It says, Now Judas and Silas themselves, being prophets, also exhorted and strengthened the brethren with many words. Now, unfortunately, we don't have those many words. But the thing I want you to see is that Judas and Silas, it mentions that they have the gift of prophecy and they were considered prophets. And it, what did they do with that gift? They exhorted and strengthened the brethren, and they had a lot to say. And, and it, it's, why didn't he record that for us? It's not one of Peter's messages. It's not the gospel message. But in church life, there should be times where you recognize, oh, I want to hear what this person has to say because they're gifted. They're, they have prophetic gifts. Everything doesn't happen from the pulpit. Everything, you know what, that, the one thing I've told you before, my wife and I pray about all the time, Lord, multiply ministry. Multiply ministry. Because it's not just about me. You know, we are such a spectator society. I go to church, I sit down, I turn it on and I watch it. I turn it off and go home. No, you're being trained for ministry. I've told you, Ephesians 4, 11 and on. You're being trained for ministry when you come to church. And, and, and so our prayer, and anybody else who catches it, who's part of the ministry team here, we're praying, Lord, multiply ministry. Because that's more than just what you see on Sunday morning. You are all in ministry. And our prayer is that you find what your ministry is and you do it. And guess what? Sometimes you don't get a badge or a name tag with it. Prophet Mike. You know, but you get a pointy hat, hat, you know, Pope Jerry, right? Aren't you glad, Jerry, we don't make you wear that Pope hat? Huh? Huh? I mean, it's not like that. It's, it's just a natural part of church life. And, and here it's, we're, we're told that these two are prophets, and they encourage and strengthen the church. And I can tell at the speed I'm going, we're not going to get halfway through my notes, but that's okay. Listen. Another incident is that Paul, he's staying at Philip the Evangelist's house. And interesting, Philip is known as Philip the Evangelist. Matter of fact, there's nobody else in the Bible who's called the Evangelist. Interesting. And this man, it says in Acts 21.9, this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. By the way, we don't get any of those prophecies. Well, tell me what they said. I don't know what they said, but they were known as, in matter of fact, they're not called prophetesses either. They're not called prophets or prophetesses. They're, it just says, by the way, Philip's uh, four daughters, uh, they're virgins. And by the way, when it says they're virgins, the, the stress uh, was on that they were single. Uh, in the New Testament, whenever it says some, a woman is virgin, that's not supposed to be a surprise. It means they're single. That should be the way it is, you know? I have a virgin daughter means I have a single daughter. Think about it, okay? All right. So he had four virgin daughters who prophesied. And, and Luke writes that we stayed with them many days. And then a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Now, this is the one I wanted to tell you about. Here's what I find interesting. No, oh, I've got all kinds of theories. Here's one of my theories. I believe that... Um, you know, we talk about a woman's place in the church, and can a woman be a pastor? Can a woman be a prophet? A woman can have every gift that a man can have. I really believe that. But there is a certain authority structure, and you could look it up in, in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, that there is a certain authority structure in the home, in the family. And even here, I believe God sent Agabus to prophesy to Paul because it was more appropriate, and you could say maybe it was because of the culture you could keep that argument if you want, but I just noticed the pattern in the scriptures that God sent a man to prophesy to Paul, even though he's staying at a house where there's four gals who prophesy. Something to think about, okay? So Agabus come, came down from Judea, and we, uh, when he had come to us, Luke is writing, he took Paul's belt, and he bound his own hands and feet, and he said, now that would be funny to watch. How do you bind your own hands and feet? He bound his own hands and feet and said, thus says the Holy Spirit, so shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. 
So this was a warning from the Holy Spirit. Paul, I just want to let you know what's coming. You're going to be tied up and turned over to the Gentiles. Now some, there was a big argument in this, and I'm not going to go to all the text on it, but some of the church looked at it like, oh, Paul, Holy Spirit's warning you, don't go. Others believe, and I, I believe this, that God was just telling them what's coming. He didn't say, don't go. Agabus was just saying, Paul, this is what's going to happen, and I want nobody to be surprised in this room. This is Paul's destiny. This is where he's going. And so what, sometimes prophecy could be a warning or exhortation. Sometimes prophecy could be, don't go. But that wasn't the prophecy here. The prophecy was, this is what's going to happen to Paul. So that guess what? When it happened, the, the, the church didn't think God is dead or something. The church didn't think, well, God failed us. Oh, God failed. No, God told us this is what's going to happen. Get, you follow me? So there's times God will just, uh, prophecy is letting you know what's coming. And Paul was convicted in his heart that, no, God wants me to go. I'm going. And, and he went. And that's exactly what happened, by the way. All right. Here's another interesting question I'm wondering. How many of you guys have ever experienced a legitimate prophetic word where someone spoke to you with a prophetic gift and you knew it was the Holy Spirit speaking to you? Can I see the hands? Raise them up high. I want other people to see that uh, how many of us are crazy, okay? Okay. Um, <clears throat> how many of you have ever received, like, the Lord has used you and you have had a prophetic word and have given it to someone else? Okay, there, look at, raise your hand, look at that. There are people, real people, that this happens to. I want you to know that we're, what we're looking at is real. It's not some weird cult thing. It's, it's in the Bible. It's all through the book of Acts. It happens to real people in your life that you know and that you go to church with, okay? And I've told you before, sometimes things in my life where <clears throat> there's been times, and I feel like I, I overtold this story, but one example that I could never forget is when I was, um, I was just feeling rejected by God, I thought that I, thought that I had committed the unforgivable sin. <laughs> That's another one. If I, if I ask for a show of hands, probably many of you felt that. Oh, God's done with me. There's no hope for me. I felt like I was done. And I went to a, a Pentecostal church that a friend invited me to, a man who had a prophetic gift, were, was calling people out of the audience and, and prophesying over them. This is many years ago. That's why he says, young man. <laughs> he called me out from the back and called me up to the front. I was shaken. I was like wet, blubbering, you know. I, uh, you think my nose runs a lot now. I mean, I, I was like, oh. And, and he called me up and he prophesied over me. He says, young man, Satan has been trying to destroy you. But God wants you to know that he loves you and you're forgiven. And, and, he, and he's got a ministry for you. And I've told you this before, but I'm going to do it again. And he starts drawing a circle in the air. He says, and, and your ministry is going to be like a circle. And it's going to concern your words. And as you continue to fast and pray and bury yourself in the word of God, that circle will continue to grow. And I'll never, never forget that. This is when I was much younger. But I'm so glad. You know what? Because I was reading the Bible. And, and I was broken. I was broken. I needed God to reach into my brokenness and speak to me personally. And he did. So I want you to see. You think, well, why do we need prophecy? We got the Bible. Because stuff like that and more. Because Paul. Could Paul read in the Bible, Paul, you're going to be tied up and handed over to the Gentiles. He wouldn't know that except somebody with a prophetic gift spoke to him. So, so I want you to know there's, there's a reason for it. It's biblical. You've got to see this, okay? So about desiring the spiritual gifts, you know, because it says in verse 1, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. Um, you can desire the gifts and especially prophecy, as it says in verse 1, but you can't choose which gift you get. Some people think, you know, I'm... I, there was a day when there, there's all these movements. You, you're around long enough, you'll see movements come and go. There was this one denomination who had the school of the prophets. Come to the school of the prophets. We'll teach you how to be a prophet. You don't get to join the prophets. God decides what gift you get. You can't go, well, you know what? What do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a prophet. How's it feel to want? You don't always get what you want, okay? 
And, and because, uh, well, let's just look back at something we looked at uh, a few weeks back. 1 Corinthians 12, 10. It says, uh, speaking about the list of gifts. He, and we went over all these before. To another, working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, different kinds of tongues. To another, interpretation of tongues. And so we've, we've explained. I'm not going to explain all these because our time is going to go quickly here. But one and the same spirit, listen to this, works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. God decides what spiritual gift you get. You can't decide, and I've seen people fake it. You don't want that. Don't fake it. God decides what spiritual gifts you get. And once you receive a spiritual gift, by the way, the only one you could choose when you use it, you could turn it on and off, is tongues. Tongues is different like that. You could decide, uh, you know, I could say, I got to go pray. I could go back behind this curtain. I could just start speaking in tongues. Yes, I speak in tongues. And so I, I could just decide. It's the only gift that you could decide to use it. But I, I can't just go, and I don't have the gift of prophecy, but if I did, I can't say, I think I'm going to prophesy today. Prophesy today. You, you, it, it's not like that. Tongues, yes. All the other gifts, no. All the other gifts of the Spirit, the only choice you got is if you're not going to do it. Okay? God can give you a word. Right now, you can be sitting there and God can give you a word. And you go, okay, I think I'll just wait and use this later. It's a word to so-and-so. I'm going to wait and talk to them after church. Yeah, I've been to churches where they go, I couldn't help myself. And they jump up and they start yelling out something. That's freaky. That's not what the Bible says. That's why we need 1 Corinthians 14. And you're waiting for me to get into it, right? But I'm telling you, there, there are gifts, and then there's the right way to use the gifts, and there's the wrong way to use the gifts. And the, the only choice you have about all the other gifts besides tongues is you can decide, no, I, I think I'm going to hold off that because the scriptures say that the, the spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets. Now, I didn't add this to the, to the PowerPoint. We'll get to that eventually. But that's one of the rules is that the spirit of the prophets is subject to the prophets. Nobody could legitimately say, I couldn't help myself. I had to stand up in church and speak in tongues. That's not the way tongues works. That's not the way any gift works. God has given you as spiritual beings, as Christians who are born again, the ability to say, no, this is not the right time and place to use that gift. Or, yes, Lord, I, I see you want me to give a prophetic word to somebody. As soon as church lets out, I'm going to go over and talk to them about this. You know, you can, we're under control. And it's not, you know what, by the way, the, I could go off on this. The only time that, that you would be out of control and you can't help yourself because the Spirit's got you and you can't help it is a demonic spirit. The Spirit of God is a gentleman. And the Spirit of God directs you gently. The Spirit of Satan drives you uncontrollably. So the only kind of uncontrollable, can't help myself thing that, that a spirit would do would be a demonic spirit. Okay? Think about that. All right. Speeding through this. And I see we'll probably only get to uh, Acts chapter 2. But here, here's the, um, the next fill-in, and it's about tongues. The gift of tongues is the special endowment that God gives certain members of the body of Christ to pray to God in a language they've never learned. Tongues is a prayer language. What we're going to see is, and I can see we probably won't have time to cover it all today, that tongues is never from God to man. God is from, from man to God. Look at verse... Oh, I already said verse 2, but I'll get the verse of tongues of prophecy. Um, 4, yeah. Look at verse 4. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. That's not the one. Um, it says, I've got it somewhere. And my concern is I want to jump ahead in my notes because I can see I'm going to have to cut this one in half. Okay, let's look at the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost is the first time we ever see tongues mentioned in the Scripture. And I'm just going to turn there in my Bible, Acts chapter 2. It says that when the day of Pentecost had fully come, 
They were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting, and there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Stop for a second. I want to also point out something. That the book of Acts, the day of Pentecost, it's very unique in many ways. Uh, it's the only time you ever see the, the gift of tongues given where there's tongues of fire, so don't freak out, okay? Well, I used too much hairspray today. I don't want the... Okay, it, it's not one of those things you have to freak out about because the only time we see tongues of fire is this one day, a unique breakthrough when God said, this is it, don't miss it, <laughs> and tongues of fire. And, and uh, this is the only time, by the way, where it actually says that these people speaking in tongues, everybody in the audience heard them in the language that they, like people were uh, in Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost, and they were coming from all over the known world. And whatever country they came from, they heard these people when they were speaking in tongues, they heard them speaking in their language. Very unique, okay? I don't see that anywhere else in Scripture because this was a one-time breakthrough but we do see the gift of tongues continuing. It says in um, <clears throat> verse 7, And they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? How is it that we hear each one in our own language in which we're born? And it gives a list of the countries. I'm going to try to move faster here. And it says in verse 11, at the end of the list, there's Christians and Arabs, and we hear them speaking in our own language the wonderful works of God. Now something I want to point out, is that when someone speaks in tongues, they're speaking the wonderful works of God. They're speaking praise. They're blessing God. They're magnifying God. Uh, I still haven't, uh, I, I don't want to get too distracted here because there's a verse later in this chapter that says, he who speaks in an unknown tongue speaks not unto man, but unto God. When you speak in tongues, you're not speaking to man. So the interpretation would be something like, Praise your name, Lord. Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for saving me. It would be a praise, and, and it would be a blessing of God. And so it says they heard them speak the wonderful works of God. By the way, the cessationists believe that tongues is a, the ability to preach the gospel to other countries. And so the cessationists say they were preaching the gospel. I don't believe so because it says they're, they're speaking the wonderful works of God. But more than that, after they heard that, Peter got up and preached the gospel. Why did Peter have to get up and preach the gospel? Because they weren't preaching the gospel. They were praising God, okay? It says, and they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? So there's times you could see a legitimate work of God and go, huh? Okay? It doesn't mean you're always going to understand it. It takes some explaining some time, okay? So let me give you some examples of the gift of tongues besides or outside of Acts chapter 2. Uh, in Acts chapter 10, while Peter was preaching the gospel, he's preaching to uh, the Gentiles and, and then friends of Cornelius. It says in Acts 10, 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon those who heard the word, and those of the circumcision who believed were astonished. And many came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out upon the Gentiles also, I'm going to stop. There's more, but wait. Peter already preached the gospel. Tongues was not the ability to preach the gospel. Peter was already speaking their language. He knew how to speak more than one language. He was speaking to the Gentiles. They were hearing him, listening intently, and the Holy Spirit came and did a work. And then it says, here's what they, they heard. They heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. That's what tongues is. It's, if you could interpret somebody who's speaking in tongues, it would be somebody magnifying God, glorifying God, speaking of the wonderful works of God, because that's what tongues is. Then Peter answered, can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we? What he's saying is, um, I think they're saved. I think they're ready for the next step. <laughs> he's saying, They've heard the gospel. Obviously, they believed in their heart. By the way, isn't it interesting? They didn't have an altar call. Okay, repeat after me this prayer. We get stuck in our, our North American, Western mentality. Well, did they say the prayer? 
I don't think these guys said the prayer. They heard the gospel, and they believed the gospel, and ding, they're born again. And they went from ding, born again, to speaking in tongues. God can do it however he wants, okay? Some people go, why, why don't you do an altar call? I'm preaching the gospel. God can do the rest, okay? You can get trapped in your methods. Okay, another example is in Acts chapter 19. There were disciples of John who didn't know the full gospel. They just understood the message that the Messiah is coming, that John the Baptist preached. And it says in Acts 19.1, <clears throat> And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said to him, We've not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Into what were you baptized? And they said, Into John's baptism. So I want you to understand, they weren't Christians yet. Some people make a big deal and say, They, they needed the Holy Ghost because they were Christians. They were Christians who needed the Holy Ghost. They were non-Christians. They were disciples of John stuck in that in-between stage. The Messiah is coming. All right, the Messiah is here. John's work is done. It goes on to say, um, Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him. That is on Christ Jesus. I'm here to preach to you about Jesus Christ. And when they heard this, they were baptized again. They were already baptized in the John's Baptist baptism. <clears throat> now listen, by the way, I believe some of us, like I was baptized as a baby. And then when I got saved, I thought, I want to I wanna get baptized now because, because I believe, not because I didn't even know what I was doing. My parents dunked me, you know. And, and I think it's legitimate that sometimes we were baptized, in, maybe it's in a different religion or in a cult or whatever. And when you really come to know Jesus, even though you were baptized already once, you look back and you go, yeah, I don't think that was good. I want to get, I didn't, I don't think that counted because I didn't get it. I want to get baptized now, understanding the gospel. And that's what happened here. And, and it says that they're baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid the hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them and they began to speak with tongues and prophesy. Now, I don't believe that that means people make formulas out of everything. People say, well, when you get baptized, uh, matter of fact, when I got baptized, oh, God, I'm not going to finish today. When I got baptized, I got baptized at a real Pentecostal church in Southern California. It was Melody Land. I don't know if any of you ever heard of Melody Land. And it was uh, Pastor Wilkinson. And was it Ralph Wilkinson? There was two of them. And, and he's, I get into the, the dunk tank, you know, there's a long story behind it. But each person he baptized, He'd pray over, and they'd come up, and they'd speak in tongues, and there's all kinds of wild stuff happening. I'm going, whoa, what's in that water, you know? And, and so, so I walk down in there, and, and he baptized me, and I come up from the water. I said, thank you, Jesus. Praise your name, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And he whispered in my ear, because it's being, they had a microphone in there so that people could hear what's going on. He whispered in my ear, get into it, kid. Get into it, boy. I dropped my hands, and I looked at him. I wanted to say, get out of here, you know. It's like, I just, I, some people try to force things because they got a little formula. You get baptized and you get the Holy Ghost. You know what? God can do whatever order, however he wants to do. And I was quenched by that. I was disappointed when he whispers in my ear, get into it, boy. The cameras are rolling, you know. I, I, so you'll never get that from me, manipulation or expectation. I expect you to do this now. Just, I'll let the Holy Spirit do what he wants in your life, but I'm just telling you, don't fight him, okay? Don't say, not me. Other people got have gifts, but I don't want to get, you know, you're fighting the Holy Spirit. That's between you and him, and I'm, I'm going to hold you down underwater. No, I'm not going to do that, okay? So, uh, one clear difference between the gift of tongues and the gift of prophecy is who you're speaking to. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians 14, and it is in verse 2. That's the one I was looking for. Uh, it says, for he who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. It's talk about the gift of tongues, because tongues can be used like, uh, any, it, it actually means language, but Paul's speaking of the gift of tongues. So I, I want you to get this and chew on this, because I'm telling you something. If you come from a Pentecostal church, the Pentecostal churches do it like this. 
Somebody stands up, speaks in tongues, and they go on and on, and everyone stops and looks, and then, and then somebody stands up, and they, they think, okay, here comes the interpretation. And they say, oh, my people, I love you, or I have a plan for you. It's, it's God speaking to man. And, and there's a misconception of what's going on here. I believe when that happens, somebody spoke in tongues, somebody prophesied, or false prophet, but it's prophecy, okay? Matter of fact, one time I was, I was teaching at our home church in, in Downey, California, and while I'm teaching, somebody got up and went off in tongues during the message. And I, I stopped and wait, and when he finished, I said, well, let's pray for the interpretation. We prayed, and then somebody in the back stood up and said something like, oh, my people, I, uh, you know, I love you. I have a plan for your life. It was, it was from God to man. And I says, okay, that was a prophecy. That was not the interpretation of that tongue. Let's wait a little bit longer for the interpretation of that tongue. And it, it never came. And so I said, <clears throat> so the Bible says elsewhere in chapter 14, if there be no interpreter, let him remain silent. So I says, so there'll be no more speaking in tongues because we don't have any interpreter here. And there was no interpretation. So we'll move on. By the way, I do it by the book. Some of you from Pentecostal churches are going, he quenched the spirit. He's got it all wrong. Well, I go by the book, okay? Read 1 Corinthians 14. It tells you, let him who speak in an unknown tongue, pray that he may interpret. But if there be no interpreters, then let him remain silent. So we tested it. There was no interpreter. That's, I just want to follow God's word, okay? But I did acknowledge that was the other person who spoke up. I didn't say, nope, that's a false prophecy. I said, that's a prophecy. Let's, I received that. And sometimes what happens is that when someone speaks in tongues, it gives someone who has a gift of prophecy encouragement to speak what's on their heart, that they're hearing from the Lord, and that's all they needed. Now I'm, they're ready to speak. They're primed. You know what I mean? So there's all different ways to explain it. And there are such a thing as false prophecy. There's a such thing as false tongues. So it, it gets deep if you really want to try to unravel it all. But what I want to point out to you in, in verse 2 here is it says, He who speaks in the tongue does not speak to men, but to God. And so if someone is speaking in a tongue, it's not preaching the gospel. It's magnifying God. It's blessing the Lord. It's speaking the wonderful works of God. They could even be saying, thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for our sins. Bless you. They could even be saying that, but it's not a message from God to man. That's what prophecy is. Tongues is God giving you the ability to say what's in your heart, that there's no way you could put it into words, that you're, you're blessing God and speaking from man to God. It says, he who speaks in a tongue, I'm back in verse 2, <coughs> does not speak to men but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut it short here because i got so much to say. Call this your introduction. Too late to call it short? Thanks, Barb. You're already over 10 minutes. Um, but, but I want you to see that these are legitimate things. The, the Bible talks about them. And uh, I want you to understand what they are and what they aren't so that we use the gifts in a proper way. And when it says he speaks mysteries, some of you may be thinking, especially if you're from a Pentecostal background, that you've seen it. Someone speaks in tongues and the interpretation is some message, some message from God to man, which I believe it, it could be a legitimate prophecy, but that's not an interpretation of the tongues. I'm repeating myself for a purpose, okay? But you may be asking, why in the world would we even need the gift of interpretation? If that person's speaking to God in prayer and tongues, let them do it. Number one, it causes confusion in the church if everyone's speaking in different languages and no one's getting anything out of it. But number two, if you do interpret it, it's kind of like reading the Psalms. How many of you guys like to read the Psalms? Okay. Why would you want to read somebody's prayer? Huh? Why would you want to read somebody's praise unto God? That's between them and God. Well, it does bless you, because you, otherwise you wouldn't have the whole stinking book of Psalms, right? And so when somebody has the gift of tongues, and they pray in tongues, and it's interpreted, we, if it's done properly, we're blessed by going, amen. Amen. As a matter of fact, it, your homework is to finish this chapter. We'll get back to it. 
Because later he even says, look at verse 16. Otherwise, if you bless in the Spirit, look at verse 15. What is the conclusion? I will pray in the Spirit. And he said later, I will sing in the Spirit. Back to verse 14. If, if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays. Re finish the chapter. You'll see words like praying in the Spirit, blessing in the Spirit. That's what tongues is. So I got good news for you. You can do it at home. Hmm? Sometimes I speak in tongues while I'm driving down the street. Sometimes I speak in tongues in the shower. I speak in tongues when I, sometimes I'm just blessed. You know, it could be, I lay my head on the pillow at night, and I'm just like, oh, and I just begin to thank God in, in the spirit. It has its proper place of your praise and thanksgiving unto God, but it is out of place if you go to some of these churches when during worship, everybody's shouting in tongues. That is not, read the chapter. Finish this chapter, your homework, okay? Oh, our small groups are going to have fun with this one this week, right? Okay. So I've got lots more to say, but we got communion here, and Barb says I'm already over 10 minutes. So, so I'm going to call the worship team up, and here's what I'm going to ask is as we worship the Lord, let me explain first of all, there, there's communion tables, two in the front, one in the back. If you're a visitor, this is how we do it. During worship, you come up and, and grab one of the uh, communion tables, uh, packages, they're, they're little cups that you peel the first part off and there's a, the communion wafer, peel the second part out and there's the grape juice and just get it, prepare it and wait for further instruction, okay? But while we're worshiping, while we're praying, I want you to wait. Don't just get up right away and grab communion. I want you to ask the Lord, Lord, is there more? Do you have more for me? Am I, am I missing something? Am I ignoring something you've been trying to do in my life and I just don't want it or have been looking the other way? Lord, do you have a spiritual gift that you want to give to me? And I've been missing it all these years. Lord, if it's tongues, I'm open. If it's prophecy, Lord, I want everything that you have for me. And so I'm asking before you get up and grab the communion, let's just sing a little bit. And you say, Lord, give me whatever gift you have for me. I'm not afraid of you. I'm afraid of weirdness of people, but I'm not afraid of you. Nothing about you is scary. It's all good. And as you begin to worship, the Lord may even give some of you. Remember we read in 1 Corinthians 14, one of the verses say, I'll, I could sing in the Spirit. You could even start worshiping and singing a song in English, and as the Lord gives you the gift, you might end up singing in, in your prayer language, in tongues. That's quite possible. I've done it. The Lord can do it, but we're, no manipulation. God, have your way. God, have your way. Let's sing this song unto him. Holy God.
Thank you so much for your great love for us, Lord. Lord, we know that your word says <clears throat> that you demonstrated that love and that while we were yet sinners, you died for us. And you've given us communion to always remember the fact of your love. Your love revealed not just in the gifts, not just in all the things we look for, and the love is seen most at the cross. So, Lord, we hold these elements before you. And we do this in remembrance of you, Jesus. You are the bread of life. You are the one who went to the cross to pay the debt for our sins. You are the one, the only one, who shed his blood on our behalf that we might be cleansed and forgiven of sin. Lord, we hold these elements in obedience to you, but mindful of you, recognizing of what these elements represent. Jesus, the bread of life, who shed his blood for our sin. And Lord, I pray that if there be anyone here today, maybe visitor, maybe regular, who's never crossed that line from death into life, hear their cry right now. As we just make our profession of faith to you, let's, let's pray. Just repeat after me, Father in heaven, thank you for sending Jesus. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I know that I've sinned. I know that you're the Savior. Forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me. Fill me with your spirit. As I take these elements now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take the elements together.
Thank you, Father. Let's all stand. And let's close in one more song of worship. And remember, it doesn't have to be a spooky thing. You seek the Lord. Just give me one more quick story before we close in this song. When I met my wife, uh, she came from a Baptist background. I came from the Calvary Chapel background. And I tried to tell her about the gifts of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues and all this when we were dating. She was a little bit apprehensive, as you might imagine. And I forget what book she had. I, she had a book she was reading in her room. What was it? Do you remember? Wind, the Winds of Fire? Well, like a mighty wind of fire. But she was reading a book about the thing. It was all based on the Bible. And, you know, I dropped her off after a date, and I just dropped her off. By the way, we kept the dates. It was about the Lord. Dropped her off after a date. She went, she went home and, 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 and started to read about it. The next time I talked to her, she goes, You know, Mike, as I was reading that book, I just began to sing praises unto the Lord in my room, and I began to sing in tongues. It just happened. It wasn't forced. We didn't have to put her in a back room and people lay hands on the shaker. <laughs> I just committed unto the Lord, and the Lord, the Lord got through to her. I want you to know, God is gentle. He's, he's a gentleman. I just encourage you to seek him on these things. Read the, the Bible. Read about it and seek him. Get along with God. You know, some people think, well, I went to Pentecostal church, and they start telling me, Shaking and saying, repeat after me, abba dabba do. You know, they do weird things. You don't have to do that. You just seek the Lord, and he's able to give you any gift that he wants you to have, and it doesn't have to be forced or manipulated. You seek him and wait on him. Be patient. He is good. Churches can be weird, but God's good. Trust him. Let's close with this song unto the Lord, and we'll, we'll pick up where we left off next week. Okay, let's worship him. Prayer team is up here to your right.